What I want everyone in this room to do is to look at this photograph. Just look at it for a few seconds and then start to think, what does this person do? Who is she? Now we all have heard the phrase, you only get one chance to make a first impression. But what if that first impression is wrong? Totally off the mark. What if that first impression is based on how we feel and how we see each other, rather than seeing the person for who they are and what they are? First impressions are the basis of implicit bias. So I ask you again, take a look at this person. And now, I'm going to ask for your participation. How many of you first saw the wheelchair? Just raise your hand. Okay. How many of you saw it, the person was a woman? Raise your hands. How many people here saw a sexualized individual? No one. Because this woman, her name is Danielle Shapak, and she is a PhD. Now, how many people thought she was an academic? Okay. How many people thought when they first saw her, first impressions, that she was a fashion model? No one. How many people thought that she was a sex expert? Anyone? No, because that's who she is. <laughs> she is a runway model. She has modeled at New York Fashion Week. She is a psychologist who talks about sex, relationships, and dating to the disability community. And she positions herself as a sex expert. Now, when you first saw that picture, no one saw a person who could do these things. So just imagine being Dr. Shapak and having to go out into the world every day and have that perception, thinking that it's reality for her everyday life. And that's the basis of implicit bias. Implicit bias is very straightforward. It is a prejudice of which we are unaware. Now, when we hear the word prejudice, it sets off all alarms. Most of us don't think of ourselves as being racist. But there is a difference. Someone who is a racist embraces their ideology. They march to the, through the streets with tiki torches saying, I don't like this group or a group of people for their faith, religion, whatever. But for most of us, if anyone said that you have a prejudice, we would be offended. We would get defensive. We would get upset. How dare you say that to me? But I want everyone in this room to know that you do have a prejudice. You do, you do, you do, and so do I. But unlike others, we are here to address it and to uncover it. Now with implicit bias, it starts at an amazingly young age, as young as five years old. And it's focused in on race and gender. As we get older, that implicit bias gets hardened and expanded into weight, into gender, into sexuality. And how does that happen? It happens because we are influenced by what we are around. So it could be our geographic region. It is our families. It is our religion. It's our cultural background and we absorb it without even realizing it. And the older we get, the harder it gets. And what is most disturbing is that we go out into the world and we project onto others 
we write the stories of others. Like you just saw me, you began to write my story even before I began to speak, just as we were writing Danielle's story. And it happened so fast. In most studies, from the time that I went from the podium to this stage, you began to form your perception of me with your bias kicking in. For most people, it's five to 10 seconds. So with that knowledge, it's like, okay, we have implicit bias, da 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 da, da. But most of us don't think you know, this could impact me in my life, my work, who I live with, where I live. It can impact my economic being. With implicit bias, there's so many negatives that we don't even know about. Let's look at the workplace. Now you see those two men up there, right? You know, they're both white, they're both attractive, you know. They are dressed well. They're both smiling, looking into the camera. But what is the obvious difference between the two of them? Height. Now let's just say these two men go into an interview for a CEO position. All right, and everything is equal. Okay, let's just say they went to an Ivy League school they um, worked at a Fortune 100 company. On paper, they're equal. But when they walk in, they're not. An implicit bias tends to lean to men who are taller. Because tall men project what? Confidence. Leadership. And if you think that's not correct, I can tell you that less than 14% of American men are six feet tall, 14%. Yet, over 60% of CEOs are six feet tall. Isn't that amazing? Think about the presidents, how tall they are. They're all basically over six feet tall. Clinton, 6'2", Trump, 6'3". The shortest president was Jimmy Carter at 5'9". Financial consequences. We women have so many things to think about, particularly the way we look. Unfairly, though it is, it's just the way it is. But here's the thing. Look at this woman. She is attractive, dressed well, a professional. But implicit bias kicks in. And here's something that is absolutely, again, unthinkable. For American women who are 1%, who have 1% increase in their body weight, they have a 6% decrease in family income. And that's according to the National Bureau of Economic Research. So with those first impressions with implicit bias, so far, you're not getting the job you want. You're not being paid equally. But it's like you're already in the workplace. What about your name? This woman, her birth name is Erin. And when she started going out and sending out her resumes in the 1990s to tech companies, she got zero response. Someone said, change your first name. Her last name is McClevy. So she went from Erin McClevy to Mac McClevy. All right. She changed nothing on her resume except her first name. She went to 0%. What do you think happened when she sent it out to Mac? Just give me a percent. Just any. 190. 90. 70% response rate just by changing her name. She was the subject of a Fortune magazine article because of that. For people whose names are Christina, Allison, let me be blunt, with white sounding names, according to the National Bureau of Economic Research, 
they can send out 10 resumes and they will get one response back. If your name is Latoya, Marcus, Dwight, black sounding names, you will have to send out 15 resumes to get one response back. So how can we climb the ladder? How can we even think about being a CEO when we can't even get through the door because of how our name sounds? And think about it. How many times have you heard a name, a Kendra versus a Victoria, and you immediately snap to a thought process that may or may not be correct? And think about, for you, how people are perceiving you simply because of your name and how it may be impacting you. Think about it in your personal life. I want everybody here to think about your best friends, your three best friends. Do they look like you? Do they have the same kind of college background, education? Do they live around, you know, where you live? Do they, the people you live around, you know, same kind of income level? Think about it. Because birds of a feather, what is it? Exactly. It is natural human inclination. But here's the thing. When you're around people like yourself, it confirms that bias. According to CNN, 69% of whites live among other whites. 59% of Hispanics live among other Hispanics. And with blacks, it's 41%. So it's like every day when we get up, when we go out to our cars or to work, it is confronting what everyone in this room is unaware of. But you can do something. We can always do something. Individuation. Remember what I said about Dr. Shapak, that when we saw her, a woman in a wheelchair, we were thinking anything but fashion model, anything but sex expert. Some of us thought academic, which was right. But the next time you see someone, and this is hard to do, because as I said, with implicit bias, it's so ingrained in us. Try not to create the person's story. Have them create it. Look at me. I grew up in the South Bronx. The moment I said that, images, right? That's okay. Single mother, et cetera. And people who don't know me will say things to me. I have been told that the reason why I speak good English is because I must have watched TV a lot. Okay. But no one ever thinks that because I grew up in the South Bronx with the children I grew up with, one is a state Supreme Court justice. Another one is an attorney, educator, doctor. So the moment I said South Bronx, people began to write stories. So try to let the other person create their own story. Get out of your comfort zone. Now, don't come up to me if you're a white person and say, I want to be your friend because you're black. <laughs> going to work. <laughs> and I know everybody here is very nice, but it's not going to work. So right now, it's the holiday season, right? All right, Kwanzaa. Go to a Kwanzaa festival. Kwanzaa is an African-American heritage event celebrating African-American heritage. It lasts for seven days. You will not be carded at the door if you're not black. <laughs> You'll be welcomed. Albany has a great Irish museum Go to it. Get out of your comfort zone. You can take baby steps doing it. The other thing is, take a test in the privacy of your own home. Harvard has an implicit association test. You can do it online. You will not, it's anonymous. There are multiple tests. You can do gender, you can do race, you can do sexuality, and you take it and then at the end, it will show where your bias lays. And trust me, because I've taken the test. 
I am shocked, appalled, and disgusted with myself. But I learn, and that's the process of why we are here. So with implicit bias, we all have it. It doesn't necessarily mean that we have to embrace it, but we can learn from it. And in this era of so many things pulling us apart, I think that once we acknowledge and address, we will find out that you and I have a lot more in common than we do not having so many differences. We'll become a richer person for it. Thank you. <laughs>